Moving's for idiots. Do you need to get from one place to another? This video is sponsored by Moving. It's good for you. Helps you do that that thing that I mentioned. Did you know, originally, Disney wanted Kingdom Hearts to be an entirely stationary game? It wasn't until late in the game's development when Tetsuya Nomura wrote to the Disney executives and said they should, they should probably be able to walk. Now, Disney wasn't going to budge, but then they added those big banana shoes, and then they said, it's perfect, ship it now! And moving around has been a staple in the series ever since. Today, I want to take a look at how movement has evolved over the major games in the series. I'm not sure if I have a point to prove, which is kind of like a cardinal sin, right? Like, you shouldn't write an essay without a thesis, but the whole point of school is to learn all the rules well enough that they let you leave, and then you break them later. And I'm not going to be beat by a bunch of rules. We're just going to be taking a stroll from 2002 to 2019 and make observations, pick out what I like and don't like, what I think works, and what I'd change if it were up to me. Well, to a degree. If it were up to me, Treasure Planet would have been in every single game. I should say this video was inspired and or requested in the comments of my KH1 World Ranking video by user I'm a Crow, who is my favorite subscriber who is also a bird. I mean, I've seen his videos and to the untrained eye he looks human, but he's clearly a bunch of birds wearing a skin suit. But I thought his idea was a neat one, so I let it marinate for a while, and here is the result of that marination. Let's start the same way Recorded History did with Kingdom Hearts 1. Everything before that was filler and non-canon. For those of you who have been watching for a while, it'll probably come as no surprise to you that I like how KH1 does it the best. With regard to getting skills that enhance your mobility, there are essentially four points throughout the game where Sora's movement options expand, and I think they're paced out perfectly. Dodge roll after Traverse Town, high jump midway through Monstro, glide after Neverland, and super glide after beating Chernabog. I think it's a bit curious that the developers left open even a slight possibility that high jump could be missed, but I think it's safe to assume that 98% of players or more completed Monstro or at least got far enough to get the ability. Even so, there's nothing stopping you from beating the game handily with Sora's regular jump, although it obviously helps to have more options and utility later on. I've touched on this before, but I think KH1 is absolutely the king when it comes to its sense of progression. As Imacro said in his comments, you start out with a basic jump and by the end you get super glide. You just feel so much more powerful. Visually, it's a marvel that this illiterate island boy who 60 hours ago was falling into traps like Wily e. Coyote is now zipping around a battlefield due to the power of flight. And it is so, so satisfying when you're exploring a world for the first time and see a chest that you can't reach and then return later with a new movement skill that helps you reach it. You just feel good, you feel smart for remembering that thing from hours ago and realizing your new ability can be used to get that shiny thing that you were denied back when you were a peasant who got places by walking. And even when there's no treasure to grab, being able to more quickly or handily go from point A to point B is immensely satisfying. And that's not just limited to super gliding through a room because it's faster than walking, it's also bypassing areas or skipping small steps in a process by using your abilities in a clever way. It's never rocket science, but it shouldn't be, at least not in a game like Kingdom Hearts, which isn't first and foremost a puzzle platformer or something like that. But it's enough synergy to make the adventure feel just a bit more... I don't know what the adjective would be here... progressy? progressive, that doesn't feel right, but I think you know what I mean. You feel growth. You start out a plain Jane, but you put the time and effort in, kill Satan, and now you're an anime jet plane. I will say, for a game that I've praised in the past for how excellently it contextualizes gameplay elements, I wish KH1, and really all of the games, put a little more thought into how it contextualizes some abilities. I mean, it's really only half of them that aren't justified super well. The glide skills in KH1 are great, and make total sense. Learning those abilities from fighting alongside Peter Pan or defeating Chernabog work as great explanations as to how Sora picks up these new moves. And I know it's kind of a one-off ability that doesn't really have much use outside of the world it's introduced in, but Ariel teaching Sora how to swim better is some more solid contextualization. But there's nothing about Monstro that makes me think, oh yeah, it's time to jump high. I especially don't like that you just open a chest and somehow unleash the knowledge of getting sick air when you jump. If there was like a song in Pinocchio about jumping for joy or something like that, it would be a cute little nod, but as it stands, the game was like, okay, it's time to stop being such shit, Sora, we're halfway through. The same goes for Dodge Roll. Like, what wouldn't it have been great if it was something you saw Goofy using during the guard armor battle and then he teaches it to you afterward? Like, Donald knows fire, but Goofy doesn't roll around in this game, so what gives? I know I'm being picky, but KH1 usually nails it with stuff like this, so I just thought I'd point it out. Obviously, not every ability you learn needs a pile of context attached to it, like I'm not expecting Sora to pick up Stun Impact or Vortex because he took some classes online. You know, these are all things you learn from leveling up, but when the game decides you're going to always get things at a certain point, I'd love just a bit of explanation. 
So, Kingdom Hearts 2. Honestly, I'm kind of torn on how it handles this stuff. There's a lot to unpack here. Well, first off, I think it's fair to say that Sora is leagues more mobile in this game than the last once you get them all powered up. At his most powerful and complete state in KH2, Sora has a big bag of tricks, a black box full of tricks even. Really cool and flashy stuff. My apprehension comes from the whole process of getting him to that most powerful and complete state. Now, lower your pitchforks and stop typing hypocrite in the comments, I know what you're thinking. You just said how cool it was to feel that sense of progression in KH1, working through the game and getting new abilities. How is it any different here? In fact, you get to see the abilities themselves get better and better as you level up your drive forms. Drink my blood and burn in hell, you skinny dork. No, please, delete that. My feelings can't take it. Listen, I like parts of it. The big deal breaker here for me is that in KH1, when I got high jump, I could just high jump. I didn't unlock a form that gave me super high jump powers for 40 seconds, and then the option to use high jump in my regular form if I go out of my way to level up my high jump form in a specific way. Now, I really like the idea of making my abilities more potent over time, that's really actually an improvement over KH1, but the process of leveling these abilities up could not feel like any more of a chore. It's a task entirely separate of playing through the game. Rather, you need to stop down and fulfill whatever requirement the specific form has if you want to be moving ahead with your abilities maxed out. It's not organically woven into your adventure, it's a side quest in disguise, and a grindy one at that. By that I mean that I really don't think I've had my Sora all maxed out by just using drive forms as I progress through the worlds, even when fighting optional mob battles as I move through each world while playing through the main story. I think if you go into a drive form at every opportunity, as soon as your gauge is filled up enough, you still won't be a high-jumping, aerial-dodging, super-gliding maniac by the time you reach Final Xemnas. That is, unless you stop down and go out of your way to level up your forms. If you're playing through the story and being incredibly trigger happy with the drive forms, it's still pretty likely that you can beat the game as the same old post-nap Sora that you started with, maybe with a slightly higher jump thanks to how Valor is leveled. I mean, you get final form randomly by driving after the Roxas battle in the world it never was, you might not even get it by the time you beat the game. I know I didn't growing up, I had no idea you could glide in Cage 2 for like my first two or three playthroughs as a kid, and I always thought it was weird, like why would they give Sora all these new flashy combat abilities but not give him glide, an ability that you were guaranteed to get in KH1. On one hand, it's kind of cool that it's sort of a secretive thing, but on the other, it crushes that feeling of progression that I love so much. I doubt too many players were gliding by the time they got the Xemnas on their first playthrough unless they happened to go grind before the final battle or they used a walkthrough. But for the uninitiated, for a first-time player charging ahead toward the final battle, you not only needed to get lucky and trigger final form before this single world was over, but you needed to level it up twice to even be able to use super glide in your standard form. I don't know if that's even possible even if you fought every nobody along the way on your climb up the castle. And that brings me to my two really quick but I think effective solutions to my issues here. One would be ditch the form specific level up criteria. As I referenced, Valor is really the only one you can pretty reliably level up just by using it as you progress through the story because it gains an experience point for every hit you land on any type of enemy. But beyond that, it's just a little too cute. I get that it adds variety and I appreciate that, but it basically forces you to stop what you're doing and go look up some way to cheese it and get quick levels to get those skills that you really want. There just aren't enough opportunities to get these forms leveled up even when used liberally throughout the main story. The worst offender here by far is Master Form, which grants you experience for picking up drive orbs, which is something that can be done outside of combat, making it the most mind-numbing to grind for. You could play with some gambler nobodies, but even then you're just fighting the same enemy over and over for the most efficient leveling method, so it's not much better. So I know it's boring, but just make them all level up like Valor Form. Hell, if you want, you can still spice it up a little, like Wisdom levels for every magic spell successfully land on an enemy, or Master only gets experience whenever you land a finisher, something like that. In theory, it's fun that they all level up in different ways, but I think we're lying to ourselves if we say it's any fun in practice. Now the second fix, and honestly the more important one, is just give Sora the most basic form of each growth ability when he first gets the form. Just make it a combo meal. Buy Valor form, get high jump level 1 for free, right off the bat. I mean, you could even make it a crappier version of the level 1 ability, but just give him something so that there's an immediate change in his capabilities when each form is unlocked. Then, if the player wants, they can go out of their way to level up the form. This way, at bare minimum, you'll be able to high jump, quick run, dodge roll, aerial dodge, and super glide just a little bit by the time you beat the game. You keep the sense of progression, and you can even keep the form-specific level-up methods. I think this is such a simple solution that would go a long way in fixing a huge problem I have with the game. Because as much as I've also taken umbrage at KH2's story pacing, it paces out the delivery of drive forms almost perfectly. Valor form is in the KH1 dodge roll spot, same for final and KH1 super glide. Wisdom is about a quarter into the game, or halfway through the first half, and Limit and Master are right around the middle. So maybe move one of those two forms further into the third quarter, but other than that, it's perfect. Unlocking all of the respective abilities upon getting 
each form would work fine, you wouldn't be sequence breaking anything from getting them earlier since they're all entirely optional anyway. It restores and enhances that sense of progression and cuts down on the grindiness. In fact, it might be even more motivating to give the player a functional but sort of watered down version of the growth ability right from the jump as soon as you get the drive form. It would serve as a bit of a tease, like, yeah, good job Sora, you can do a little dash, it works fine and all, but you could be sliding around like the floors grease with Crisco if you just put in a little bit of work. I know you kind of get that already when you just use the actual form, but there's no reason the most basic iteration of each growth ability for standard Sora should be locked behind two levels of grinding. Let us have it up front and let us decide if and when we want to beef it up. Hooray, I did it. I fixed a game that everyone loves. <laughs> That all being said, to bring it back to essays, my English and writing teachers ever since I was a kid would always say, your essay should answer the question, so what? You can have all this stuff laid out and it can even look really nice, but if it's not building up to anything, if it's not working towards something, then so what? And so even if KH2 were to miraculously and retroactively fix the problems I have with the growth abilities and let me fly and dash and dodge around exactly when and how I specified, I'm still kind of left feeling a little bit of, so what? Now don't get me wrong, it feels great to do all of those things, it's satisfying to use all of these abilities. Twirling around in the air with aerial dodge looks and feels good, super gliding is incredibly fast, but it's kind of like being a gymnast in an open field without any beams or bars or trampolines to play with. Sure, you're still pretty agile, you can pull off some cool looking moves without any of that stuff, and I bet you can get from one end of the field to the other much quicker than the average Joe, but there's not really anything to interact with. You're just a lonely but very flexible person in a world designed for people who walk around normally because, well, all of your skills are optional. I mentioned this in my initial written response to our bird friend's comment that I think the discussion of motion in these games, and probably many others, is inherently linked to world design. The way you use your car and the type of car you buy is heavily influenced by the terrain and roads you'll be driving it on. You know, it's kind of like a chicken or the egg thing here, like which came first with KH2, the world design or the drive forms. The game kind of painted itself into a corner. You can't design your worlds in a way that requires the use of growth abilities because they're all optional, but then you're left with a series of pretty plain rooms that are all traversed the same way. And then, even if you max out all of your growth abilities, there's really not much to do with them beyond collecting puzzle pieces, which... I don't know, does anyone find these satisfying to come back for? And that's a genuine question. I really don't, but maybe you do. They don't really give off that same feeling of accomplishment for me, maybe because you're not actually being rewarded unless you just grab the last one to complete a set. And they're also not Dalmatian puppies, but it's hard to top that in fairness. But the movement options in Cage 2 outside of combat end up not meaning all that much to me because Cage 2 just doesn't have worlds that make the most of it. I don't know what exactly it is, I guess it's best described as a scaling thing. The worlds feel smaller in Cage 2, maybe not as a whole, but when you break it down and take a look at each room. Or maybe some spaces are bigger than they were in Cage 1, but they're more often than not emptier. Or maybe Sora's bigger, or maybe it's all of those things combined. But Sora feels less present, like less tangible when walking around in a space. Like, he's not in a room, he's just in a picture of a room. There's less to physically interact with. With, there aren't really as many things to climb up or jump on. Barring like one occasion that I'll highlight later, there's never really a time when you see a room and go, whoa, this is gonna be a process just to get through, and that's on top of fighting any enemies that might show up. There's zero intimidation factor as far as a room goes. There's no rising falls, no Oogie's Manor or Cave of Wonders Hall. There's almost never more to a room than meets the eye, and so your growth abilities are never really used to get to new spaces or reach hidden items. They end up amounting to you just doing a big jump at the start of the room and then super gliding to get through it faster so you can move on to something else that the game cared more about, like combat, because it's not like there's really any exploring to do. And granted, these abilities often have much more utility in combat, which is great. Using quick run or dodge roll for invincibility frames or to get away from an attack are helpful skills to have, I just wish we got the best of both worlds. When KH1 gave me high jump and glide, I could use them to outmaneuver enemies in combat, but also to reach the previously unreachable and in ways that didn't feel tacked on, like the puzzle pieces literally were in KH2 Final Mix. Of course, the big exception to my complaints here is another thing added by the Final Mix version of the game, which is the Cavern of Remembrance. Now, does anyone dislike this area? That's another genuine question. I've seen people take issue with how difficult it can be in some spots, particularly those final hallways before the garden, but the actual platforming stuff always seems to be a big hit, at least from what I've seen. How about you? Do you like this part of the game? Comment and subscribe so I can get that next hit of dopamine. But man, I wish the entire game was like this. I mean, maybe not as intensive and drawn out as the cavern is, but just like a room or two in each world that makes you think just a little bit about how to progress through it. I know we kind of come back to the issue of needing optional abilities in non-optional spaces, but if Cage 2 were to co-opt my idea about getting the first level of an ability upon unlocking each drive form, the game could design its worlds around those guaranteed milestones and work in just a little bit of platformy puzzly stuff with high jump and quick runs and air dodges and whatnot, stuff that you'd be able to accomplish with just the base abilities. You know, I'm saying 
like, oh, if only KH2 would change this stuff, as if it's like an actively worked on project that hasn't been out since a time when I thought babies were made by kissing. You get what I mean, though. Even if it was something that could be changed whenever, nobody should be listening to me about anything. Even you. Comment below if you're having doubts about watching this far. But wouldn't it be cool if, like, the Undercroft and Dungeon area in Beast Castle was a bigger and more intimidating space that gave you opportunities to use your high jump to get over some small gaps or stuff like that? Or if the Cave of Wonders in Agrabah had spaces that you could only get through by using Quick Run? Maybe you have to time it right to avoid getting spit on by those rude statues from KH1? Again, at this point, I know we're talking more about world design than mobility, but as I said, I think some more cooperative world design is how we answer that so what question. If you want to have cities, you've got to build roads. I know I spent a lot of time on KH2 here, but I think a lot of my general feelings about how it handles these things are going to inform how I view the games that follow. Now originally this video was just going to cover the three mainline games, but I figured I'd also talk about some of the side games because I want to. And I also figured I would ignore covering some of the other side games because I don't want to. I mean, listen, as much as I would love to bust out my DS and pop in days or recode it, I don't know if the juice is really worth the squeeze there. Plus, I don't really consider them relevant steps in a process that got us to KH3, whereas I think the influence of Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop Distance is still something that can be felt at this point in the series. So that being said, Birth by Sleep. Uh, I haven't been on the record talking about it too much yet, but I think it's underrated both as a whole and in individual aspects, even when comparing it to the numbered titles. I'd like to talk about it a bit more in depth sometime down the road, so I'll try to keep things focused on the task at hand for now. Regarding movement, I think BBS is kind of a mixture of KH1 and 2, and for me that statement applies to a lot of things about this game. In a way, BBS is kind of an outlier considering you play as three characters, and while everyone is based on the same fundamentals, each character has a different feel and different quirks to their movement. Slower but strong terror has his shoulder check dash move, the magic oriented Aqua gets a boost to her jump with double flight and gets around a bit unconventionally with cartwheels, and then you've got Ven, who's more like Sora than anything else, even in the way he moves. Not to focus too much on the story beats of it all, but that's some great story and gameplay integration, or character and gameplay integration, I suppose. Obviously, we know that they based Ven's skills on some stuff that Sora did in previous games, but knowing what we know about these characters' connection gives us some fun new perspective on KH1. Ven went around dodge rolling and super gliding, and his time spent as Sora intestinal squatter informs how Sora would move around once he got to be around Ven's age. Well, you know, around Ven's age, in quotes. On one hand, I did always find it kind of annoying that you can only use Glide as one character, but on the other, I'm okay with it because of that Sora and Ven connection. I also always thought Terra kind of got shafted, both in fan reception and movement options, as while his colleagues are given a few tricks to play around with, Terra is basically confined to a dash, and then a follow-up dash. And on top of that, it's not entirely unique to him, it's something that Aqua and Ven can learn to do, at least in the air. Although, again, given Terra's emphasis on strength over agility, maybe it makes sense that he ends up having fewer options. Sort of like with Cage 2, there are things I quite like about how BBS handles movement, but a few aspects I've got issues with. Maybe it's because I've played through it fewer times than one or two, but I have a much fuzzier sense of progression and when each character gets new options. Off the top of my head, all I can really recall is that Aqua gets double flight in Neverland and Ven gets super glide from a chest in Disney Town. To circle back to contextualization of ability acquisition, which is a fancy way of saying why get thing, BBS rarely makes an effort to make sense. Ven gets high jump after beating Vanitas for the first time, Terra gets air slide after an unversed mob fight in Dwarf Woodlands. These events and these abilities just aren't connected in my mind. To make matters worse, some abilities are just located in optional chests like the aforementioned super glide or Terra's high jump in the deep space prison block. So, once again, you can very easily miss these upgrades and beat the game without them. Normally, I would praise the game for rewarding the player for exploring, but I would prefer that it stay limited to combat abilities instead of movement skills. If I'm doing chest cleanup for journal completion in the postgame as Terra or Ven and I happen to stumble on one of their missable movement skills toward the end of my search, that's really annoying. It kinda sucks if I miss the pretty inconspicuous chest on my first visit and then happen to visit those worlds in the wrong order. You mean I could've been super gliding and high jumping three hours ago? I don't mind missing a powerful combat ability because you've just got so many options in a fight. Missing triple Farraga or something is unfortunate, but I don't really feel ripped off in the same way, and maybe that's just me. Of course, we're kind of burying the lead here. Movement abilities, as well as every action in the game beyond walking, act as equipable commands in each character's command deck. This isn't super relevant for the early early hours of each campaign as far as movement goes, but once you get a new movement ability you have to either add it to your deck or replace the inferior redundant ability with the new one. And these movement commands, just like the combat ones, also level up the more you use them, becoming more effective with each level. This is pretty much exactly what I wanted from the KH2 growth ability, so it's a welcome change for me. You have immediate access to the ability once you get it, and it gradually gets better as you use it. Speaking of KH2, I think BBS makes a vast improvement in that movement abilities are much more useful in exploration and in revisiting old areas. In 
general, I tend to prefer BBS World Design over Cage 2 because it feels like this game is giving me more opportunities to put my abilities to use. I feel like having all of my movement abilities actually makes a difference when exploring. Areas like the Gizmo Gallery in Disney Town or the Rainbow Falls Ascent in Neverland are what I had in mind for what Cage 2 should have had more of. Even less flashy areas like the Gates in Enchanted Dominion or the Vault in Dwarf Woodlands have a bit more depth to them than they would have had in Cage 2, and they lend themselves much better to making the movement abilities feel worthwhile to have. Again, nothing mind-numbingly difficult or complex, but areas that you can't get through by just holding the left stick forward. I still think there's something weird going on with the scaling, I don't quite feel as part of the world as I did in KH1, but I still think it's mostly a step in the direction I prefer. But this game brings back that satisfying feeling of using an ability to reach previously unreachable treasures, and it was sorely missed, at least for me. Oh, and regarding using your abilities to reach things, that's not always restricted to commands that are listed as movement commands. You know, every Kingdom Hearts game has its exploits, but there are a couple that you can really bend to your will. When games like BBS, Dream Drop, and even Chain of Memories allow you to pick a bunch of commands or cards a la carte, the opportunity to cheat the system becomes apparent very quickly. Now usually this license to cheese is most often associated with combat, like using mine attacks or Balunga to devastate an enemy's HP, but it also applies to exploration in some cases. Some abilities intended for combat, like the Surge and Dash line of attacks, can effectively be used as ways to increase your hang time when moving in the air horizontally. There there are a couple of scenarios where this can be used to access chests a bit earlier than intended. Spots that the developers probably intended you to use high jump and air slide for can be invalidated by a couple of creative fire dashes. I don't think this really bothers me, even when I'm more inclined to believe that it's more of a bug than a feature. The developers probably understood that the properties of some combat abilities also had implications on exploration, and maybe they just didn't care to go back and prevent them from being used to get things early. Maybe they were even fully aware of each case where it's useful. I don't think doing this ever breaks the game too badly, so it's not that big of a deal. I didn't talk about it in the cage one section because it's pretty minor, but there were a handful of occasions in that game where swinging your Keyblade mid-air can give you enough extra momentum to get items early, and this is basically a more extreme version of that. Did the devs want you to Keyblade jump or sliding dash your way into early treasures? Probably not, if I had to guess, but were they aware it was something you could do? I'd have to think so, and I don't really think it's bad game design, although maybe I'm being results-oriented because this would be a different story if one of those chests gave you access to something that could really break the game. Last note on BBS and a small one, but I appreciate the addition of applying damaging effects to movement abilities like Aqua's Fire Wheel or Terra's Sonic Impact. It feels like a natural evolution of these abilities, like of course they should eventually go on to have even more utility in combat. I especially like Ven's Fire Glide, which gives you the choice of trading off the speed of Super Glide for the damaging effects of its slower counterpart. Fun stuff. So, full disclosure, I have much less experience with Dream Drop when compared to every other game discussed in this video. I've essentially done two full playthroughs, one back when it came out on 3DS in 2012, and once on the 2.8 release. I've messed around with it here and there, and maybe started and abandoned a playthrough or two, but it is definitely the game I'm least familiar with out of this batch. Obviously, the main thing we think of when Dream Drop is brought up, maybe after time travel, is slow motion. I remember thinking, oh, this is the gimmick of the game. It was the first time Kingdom Hearts really felt like that to me, not that it's necessarily a bad thing. It was the same vibe I got from seeing triple battles in Pokemon. It wasn't something I really thought would stick, and it seemed like a flashy gameplay element to use in advertisements. For better or worse. And what a surprise, I think it's a mix of both. The air is very nice up here on top of this fence. I'll talk about the good first. Flow motion, especially the first time around, is incredibly fun. Dashing, spinning, grinding on rails, and just generally parkouring around looks cool, feels good, and it's especially satisfying to do in familiar rooms like the original three Traverse Town districts. But not only is flow motion exciting and useful for you know, motion purposes, but its integration into combat adds an extra layer to things. Interacting with the environment and specific enemies using your flow motion skills imparts an increased sense of improvisation on even random mob battles, leading to some pretty hectic fights. It paves the way for opportunities for the player to feel crafty and clever and just badass about how they decide to play things. Flow motion has some high ceilings, but also some pretty low floors. And speaking of floors, if you had to play a game of The Floor is Lava within a Kingdom Hearts game, your best bet would be to pop in Dream Drop Distance. It's also a good game to pop in if you ever feel like rejecting what a game gives you by actively and aggressively beating that thing over the head with something else the game gives you. Flow motion spits in the face of world design, thoughtful platforming, and I would assume dinner table etiquette if I had to guess. An example of this has stuck in my mind ever since I played the game back in 2012. This area in Prankster's Paradise has this little obstacle course set up around the perimeter of the room, and it clearly looks like you're supposed to use the platforms and poles to get to the chest at the highest point. But you can just completely invalidate this by wall kicking right up to the top. 
And like, they knew you could use flow motion, in fact, you'd need to use it to latch onto those poles for the quote-unquote intended method, so I don't get it. Why would anyone opt for the slower and more difficult path to the top? Like even the section in Country of the Musketeers, why even bother jumping up these platforms? Who needs even a modicum of precision when you can just run into a wall over and over? Why did they bother adding these cute things like these tree branches if they're entirely unnecessary and usually a waste of time? Now in Birth by Sleep, I talked about how you could use attack commands to bypass certain barriers and I didn't really have a problem with it, so I may be coming off as inconsistent. But for me, the difference is that in BBS, it required a bit of creativity, and you were usually working harder and smarter to get something. In this case, you're just using something you have right from the beginning, and it's basically always the answer to anything the game has to offer. I remember this design fallacy really bothering me even when I first played the game at age 15. And, I mean, I wasn't like a little dumbass back then, but I was also probably a lot likelier to just accept or ignore something here because, hey, it's Kingdom Hearts. It just seems so... bad? <laughs> Anytime Dream Drop tried to present me with some platforming segments, I would kind of just laugh and do it the easier way. And it felt like such a missed opportunity and such a fumble because I always appreciate whenever Kingdom Hearts games inject platforming and explorative elements into its levels, as you can probably tell from my past takes on these things. The wall kick thing is even a problem in combat in some spots, like this is the final fight in the game against the Armored Ventus Nightmare, and if you want, you can just wall jump up to the top and camp out while your commands reload. Like I know we can already break this game by shooting balloons at him, but you can even destroy him with your impeccable defense. You may have noticed that I haven't yet touched on any of the classic KH movement abilities like high jump or double flight or even glide, and that's because they're pretty invalidated too. It's kind of hard to care about my jump getting upgraded when I can easily get more height by just bouncing off the nearest wall. And it's not like walls are often in short supply, places tend to have walls. And I mean, I think the obvious fix for all of this is the one they ended up using in KH3, which is limiting the player to one wall kick that gives you height and then resetting whenever you land. Although in some cases, like the tent in Prankster's Paradise, you can still invalidate these little platforming segments by just using a wall jump to get to a higher point, landing, and then using it again. So it's not a perfect solution, but one I would have thought they'd have implemented in the first place. So as broken and nullifying as flow motion can be, it's still incredibly convenient, and I remember thinking how it would be really difficult to play a new Kingdom Hearts game that didn't give you this level of mobility. How do you go from bouncing off of walls and infinite climbing every single surface to not doing that. To bring it back to contextualization, flow motion always at least made sense in Dream Drop. Obviously Sora and Riku have always been capable of breaking the laws of physics, but the especially fantastical and rule-breaking flow motion could be excused and explained by the setting of the sleeping worlds. But I was definitely worried about how future titles could strike a balance between making sense, having less faulty world design, and affording the player the speed and convenience of flow motion. But I think they pretty much did just fine. Maybe it's the seven year gap between games, but I never really found myself sorely missing flow motion, at least to the extent that it existed in Dream Drop. Its presence has been heavily reduced for KH3, but it doesn't feel forgotten about, and I think that's probably the best way to handle it. We're not in a dream world anymore, but Sora was still able to take what he learned in his last adventure and apply it to this one, which can't always be said for video game characters moving from one installment to the next, including Kingdom Hearts games. I'll start with a massive positive in KH3's column, albeit maybe a more subjective one. Finally, at last, the worlds feel like they're properly scaled and designed in a way that cooperates with all of the crazy shit that Sora is able to do. I don't feel like a giant stomping around the diorama world anymore, and it feels like Sora is actually a part of the world he's exploring. I can jump high and run up walls and fly around, but the world seems to have gotten the memo this time, and it exists in a way that allows these abilities to be useful. I probably still prefer the tighter and more contained style of Cage 1, but I personally felt so relieved and pleasantly surprised that Cage 3 managed to allow Sora to be as mobile as he is, while simultaneously keeping the worlds on his level. If there's one way Cage 3 drops the ball in the movement department, it would be in imparting that sense of progression, as iMicro highlighted in his comments. It's hard to feel like you're getting all that much stronger if you start off with a pretty versatile moveset. It's definitely helped by not being as insanely acrobatic as you were in Dream Drop, but I think the problem is less with your starting point and more with your ending point not looking all too different. We still pick up high jump, double flight, and glide, but these have all become kind of old hat at this point. Not that they shouldn't be here, but we've gotten pretty used to them by now, and there's not a whole lot of wow factor attached to them anymore. Also, I know some people are surprised and a little annoyed by how late you get glide, but I kind of give that a pass. It's about the same spot you'd hypothetically gain access to in Cage 2, and plus having it any earlier would definitely invalidate your first visit to a world like San Francisco, and I just went on a whole tangent about invalidating a game's world design. Although going back to San Francisco afterward with glide equipped is a standout moment for me personally. The world is preserved and respected for your first visit, and then you can come back and lord over it with your new powers, which is something I am always a fan of. But yeah, for an installment that serves as the culmination of a 17 year long arc, you end up pretty much the same as you started. It definitely is a tricky spot, 
as I'm a crow stated. If you start out completely useless, it makes less story sense, but starting out pretty souped up greatly cripples the power creep. Maybe Sora just plateaus now, like obviously he's going to start the next game at square one for you know, reasons, but maybe he just doesn't have anything flashier to learn. You can only take things so far while also ensuring that Sora doesn't just dog walk anything in his path, whether that's an enemy or an environment, so we shall see. But beyond that, I really don't have too much to say about KH3's movement, at least on a major design philosophy level, because I think it does things right for the most part. Maybe I'm in the minority here, but I think it just feels damn good to play. I thought that when we got a taste of the new engine with Aqua in 0.2, and it delivered when KH3 proper came out two years later. There are so many little additions and quality of life changes that make the experience so much smoother and more dynamic. Sliding down sloped surfaces, that little extra kick in momentum you get when you start running for more than a few seconds, uh, using magic when moving in your standard form, auto vaulting over small obstacles, it all goes a long way. If we didn't get too many big additions in this game, it's practically made up for by all of those small bells and whistles. Maybe this is all stuff that should be the basic expected standard from a game of this genre releasing in this year, and so of course it's always going to look good when compared to older generation installments, but hey. When tracking the evolution throughout the series, things have never felt as natural and fluid as they do here, if you ask me. Which, speaking of fluid, this game managed to make me not hate its underwater portions. That's not just an accomplishment for a Kingdom Hearts game, that's a rare sight in video games in general, at least in my experience. Do I still prefer being on land? Of course, but being underwater is not nearly as much of a handicap as it was in KH1, and KH3's underwater parts manage to avoid feeling sluggish and limiting. And speaking of being limited, screw that, let's run up walls finally. We could do it with the memory skyscraper in KH2, so why not on other stuff? Why not Rapunzel? Tower. I've seen some people express annoyance regarding the glowing white lines on surfaces you can run up, but I think the alternative is being unsure of which surfaces you can run up. I see the phrase immersion breaker being thrown around regarding that, and sometimes it's just like, Christ, if that bothers you so much, then everything must be an immersion breaker with you people. It must kill you that you have to hold the controller and press buttons. Doesn't that just tear you away from your immersive experience? Why aren't TVs in our eyeballs yet? This is breaking my immersion. I'm being an obtuse dickhead here, but I really could not find the energy to be bothered by these relatively innocuous pale white lines even if I wanted to, which I don't. Alternate Universe Kingdom Hearts Twitter is crying over how the game is unclear on which walls you can run up because the devs forgot to include a simple and unobtrusive indicator, and for once I'm glad this is the universe that I occupy. Honestly, this is probably what they should have done to fix some of the issues with Dream Drop Distance. Make only some surfaces compatible with flow motion and mark them as such, that way you can fence off areas that require more traditional platforming with acrobat retardant walls. That was a new sentence, for sure. And also, to briefly be six years old again for a sec, running up walls is very mega cool, and also when you jump from a tall structure and, and you enter freefall mode and then you crush your prey when you reach ground level, that's very, very good, and I like that. <coughs> yes, so... All in all, I'm pretty comfortable with how things are trending for the series as far as its movement and environments are concerned. None of these games have done every single thing perfectly, but I think KH3 has been a synthesis of most of the good stuff about past iterations, barring that flimsier sense of progression. Priority number one for me is having worlds that feel suited for what Sora is able to do, and KH3 pulls that off, and I hope it's something that the series sticks with moving forward. As always guys, thanks so much for watching. Um, as has been the trend lately, this was something a little bit different. I haven't really taken an idea or topic and sequentially gone through a bunch of games like this before, so let me know if you enjoyed. And I always like hearing what you guys have to say in the comments, because sometimes you bring up points I hadn't considered, or things I straight up forgot about, so please do share your input. Thanks again to I'm a Crow for the topic in the first place, and a special thanks to all my subscribers out there. I mentioned it in passing in my tier list video, but I passed 100 subs a little while back, and I didn't really anticipate that this channel would be anything more than like... 20 people watching in silence. Uh, but I love how interactive and encouraging you guys have been. I love seeing the familiar names and getting to know more about everyone and their experiences with these games. You guys are like my regulars, and I truly appreciate the continued support. Nothing specific planned for the future, but I'm open to suggestions. That's what this was, and I enjoy doing it. So, uh, world rankings, obscure KH2 stuff, another game mechanic deep dive, a tier list, I'm all ears. I'd run a YouTube poll, but I, I guess I'm not allowed to do that yet, last time I checked. Uh, so let me know if there's anything you'd want to hear me ramble about next. That's all for me. I'm going to go run into a wall and start my new life of never walking on the ground again. Peace out. For those of you who stuck around to the end, I've got a, a glitch that I encountered when I was gathering footage while playing through Birth by Sleep. Um, it's something that I've experienced once before on, I think, KH1. Um, it's not anything new, I've definitely seen it uh, posted in other places, but it's, it's very disturbing and I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to turn your volume down because it's an incredibly loud glitch that uh, it, it basically just sounds like a jet engine 
being possessed by an angry demon. Uh, it just comes and goes without explanation. Um, if you do know how or why this occurs, I'd love to know it. But uh, <laughs> here's that. So I'll leave you with this. And there you go. Sleep tight, everybody.